Good day. My name is Paul, and I'm a driver guide for Ambassadors Gray Line in Halifax, Nova Scotia. You're looking right now at a picture of the Fairview Lawn Cemetery on Chisholm Avenue, just off of Connaught Avenue in the north end of Halifax. This is one of three cemeteries used for the victims of the terrible disaster of April 1912. We all know the story of the ship, the Titanic. We know its terrible fate as it sank two miles below the surface of the North Atlantic. We know that 1,500 people were lost. 705, 706 were rescued in lifeboats. Of 2,200 or 2,300 that were on board that ship, that faithful cruise. Maiden voyage never came back. Today I'm going to take you for just a little tour of the Fairview Lawn Cemetery. There are 121 victims buried here. There is a Jewish Baron de Hirsch Cemetery that has 10 victims buried. I may list the names for you. As well as the Mount Olivet Catholic Cemetery, which I'll also try to list the names for you although there is another video for the Mount Olivet Cemetery, which I hope to edit, similar to this one. So let's get started. What I'll be doing is basically walking you to each of the stones, and uh, there's no sound. I hope you don't have any disturbing sounds of wind or anything, and that's what makes this so easy. So we're going to make our way now, and we'll go to the first stone of Luigi Gatti. The stones are all donated by the White Star Line, Black Granite. So let's stop here at Luigi Gatti. Luigi Gatti. So 39-year-old restaurateur. He owned or worked at two Ritz restaurants in London. He brought all his staff with him on the Titanic. All of them were lost. And the reason they knew it was Luigi Gatti was that he had a teddy bear from his son. His son had given him that teddy bear and told his father, basically, don't be afraid. And so they found Luigi Gatti, number 313. Obviously, he would have been afraid because they found it, his arms wrapped around the teddy bear. So Luigi Gatti, number 313, was a restaurant manager. And he was the 313th body plucked from the ocean. Simon Sather, number 32, was a third-class passenger. Malcolm J. Johnson, number 37, was a third-class passenger. J. Hutchinson, number 250, was a vegetable clerk part of the crew. Luigi Gatti was considered part of the crew as well. Of course. Henry Price Hodges, 149. He was a second class passenger. Jacob A. Johansson, 143. He was a third class passenger. John H. Chapman, number 17. He was a second-class passenger. Albert K. Anderson, number 260, was a third-class passenger. M. Du Zacharyan, number 304, was a third-class passenger. In loving memory of Ernest Waldron King, he was a purser's clerk, part of the crew, number 321. Thomas A. Mullen, 323, he was a saloon steward.
A. Mayo Martino, number 201, was a third class passenger. This particular role only has a couple unidentified. This is one of them, number 308. He is an unknown male as far as his status is concerned. They've never been able to identify him. H. Whitman, number 315, was a bedroom steward. A. Stanbrook, number 316, was a fireman. And we'll see lots of firemen, part of the crew, who passed away. They kept the lights on up until about two minutes before the ship went down. True heroes. Arthur Albert Howell, number 319, he was a saloon steward and part of the crew. Joanne Onrik Kilviner, Kilviner, well, you have to help me with the name on that one, pronunciation, number 165. He was a second class passenger. This is an important stone. This is Ernest Edward Samuel Freeman. I think I back out a little bit. Yes, this stone was erected by Mr. J. Bruce Ismay. Not only was Mr. Freeman a uh, deck steward, but he was also Ismay's secretary. And so this stone is much bigger than the rest because Ismay, of course, the CEO of the White Star Line, was quite... Uh, capable of affording such a stone in the Fairview Lawn Cemetery. Thomas Story, number 261, third class passenger. James Edward Cartwright, number 320, was a saloon steward. Elliot, Everett Edward Elliot. He was number 317. As you can see on the very bottom of the stone, each man stood at his post while all the weaker ones went by and showed once more to all the world how Englishmen should die. Number 317, a true hero. He was a trimmer and a crew member on the Titanic. Further up the first row, Italo Donati, number 311, was an assistant waiter uh, as a crew member on the ship. Number 226, Thomas Moore Tutan. He was a saloon steward as crew member on the Titanic. Gustav J. Johansson, number 285. He was a third class passenger. Gilvard, number 305, was a second class passenger. Thomas J. Everett was a third class passenger. Frederick Sawyer, number 284 was a third-class passenger. Mr. R. Reeves, number 280, was a fireman. F. Roberts, 231, was a butcher. Number 272, J. White, he was a crew steward. D. Matheson, number 192, also crew. He was an able seaman. Alfred King, number 238. He was a lift attendant. 
one of the elevators on the Titanic. Mr. Cave, I always used to like to stop at Mr. Cave's stone. And I'll be memory of Herbert Cave. He was 39 years of age. His number is 218. He was originally from the Olympic, and he happened to have on him, he was a saloon steward, but he happened to have on him a partial list of the first class passengers. Rather an interesting find. I'll put a website where you can find all this information out in the description below. One ninety one is R. J. Davies. He was a saloon steward. H. W. Ash, number thirty four. He was a crew cleaner. Edward J. W. Rogers, number two eighty two. He was an assistant storekeeper, crew member on the Titanic. Again, Henry Allen, 145, a crew member. He was a fireman. Talbot, George Frederick Charles Talbot. Number 150, he was a steward and a crew member. R. Butt, number 10 was a saloon steward. F. Marsh, number 268, was a fireman. Arthur White, born March 11th, 1875, and died April 15th, 1912. As you can see below, his number is 247. He was an assistant barber. Charles Schillebert, 195, he was a trimmer in the bowels of the ship. E. Pogi, or Pogi, number 301, was a waiter. Alma Paulson. First lady we've come across. All the rest have been men, crew members. This is the first lady. She was a third class passenger. As you can see, she was 29 years old. She had four children. Her husband, Niles Paulson, was already quite successful in, uh, in Chicago. He drove a, uh, a, uh, a bus, or in those cases, a, a, a tram car. And he had saved enough money and scrimped enough money to to send money home to buy tickets for his wife and four children, as you can see listed below, two, four, six, and eight years of age, Costa, Stina, Paul, and Torberg, and they were to come over on the Titanic and start their new life. They never did find the bodies of the children, so the bodies of the children are not in the Fairview Lawn Cemetery, but Alma Paulson is. He wanted his name, his wife's name, and his children's name on this stone, the entire family. Is laid to rest here in that stone. The first female. Ernest Price, number 186, was a barman. J. W. Marriott. This is not of the Marriott Hotel chain by any stretch. And you'll notice he is number two. He was a pantry steward. And you'll notice that there is no number one in the cemetery as we go around. And number two will be the lowest number you'll see. The first uh, person that was hauled out of the water was a 10 or 11 year old boy who uh, had uh, family in uh, Philadelphia or somewhere down in that area of the United States and they could afford. So he was first class and they set number one home. So this is number two, just a bit of a highlight there. We're almost to the top of the first row. Ralph Giles, number 297. He was a second class passenger. And 
John Reginald Rice from June 16th to April 15th. He was a clerk, first class. And you'll notice, Nearer My God to Thee, which is the song that the band played. Now we're looking at the Stone of the Unknown Child. What's interesting about this stone is that the unknown child was found by the crew of the Mackie Bennett. There were two ships that I know of, Mackie Bennett and the Minia. And they found this number four, unknown at that time. And they were so taken by this little boy, a little fur collar around his, his collar and little mittens on and some leather booties, that they decided they were going to take claim to that little boy. And so they supplied the casket, this stone, as you see here, and they were pallbearers. And you might have... Uh, thought that, well, maybe this is one of uh, Alma, Al, um, sorry about that, uh, Alma Paulson's sons. There was a two-year-old. Well, in 2001, there was some DNA taken, and it was error. It was an error. But later on, in 2004, 2007, they uh, I positively had a maternal identity for the DNA to the Goodwin family, and they later find out that it's Sidney Leslie Goodwin. They found a bone, three teeth. They were asked to, uh, they asked to uh, exhume four bodies in 2004. And an interesting sideline, a police officer who took out the clothes and burned them, saved shoes of a little boy. And those shoes were found after being handed down through a will. And it said on them, made in England. I may not have said it, but they were certainly shoes that were designed and made in England, and they would fit a 19-month-old English boy. So he was positively identified not only by his little shoes, but by the DNA of the 2000s. And so this stone, although he has his own stone, as you saw there, this stone represents all the children that were lost, first, second, and third, on the Titanic. As you can see, there's always something left on that stone. William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison was a first class passenger, male, and he was the private secretary to Bruce Ismay as well, hence the large stone. And on the side of that stone is engraved the word bishop. Now, why would there be a bishop on the side of the stone? Well, in 1912, a contract was given to Bishop Monuments. And of course, they designed the stone for Harrison. But he was strictly a first class passenger. So, as we make our way to the second row here, we'll take a look again at Robert D. Norman, number 287. He was a second class passenger. Thomas F. Baxter, number 235, was a linen keeper. George Lefebvre, number 211, was a saloon steward. I'll try to go a little faster for you here. G. Ingram, number 204, was a trimmer. R. A. Wareham, number 246, was a bedroom steward. E. Grediage, number 276, was a fireman. Number 222, Frank Corey, he was a greaser.
George H. Dean, number 252. He was an assistant steward. Larger stone, the family must have had a little bit of money. 138, Elf Fellows. He was an assistant boots steward. 273, Sidney Holloway. He was an assistant clothes, clothes steward. W. McQuillan was a fireman, number 183. Number 219 was a crew member, male. Number 139 was a crew member, male. Number 228 was a male, unknown status on the ship, all these people. Number 279 was an unknown status, male. 221, Baptiste Alara, an assistant waiter. And obviously someone uh, recognized him. 205, J. Ackerman, number 205, assistant pantryman. Number 267, J. Brown was a fireman. Number 242, R. Hosgood was a fireman. Number 251, William Carney was a lift operator. Number 227, aha, J. Dawson. He was a trimmer. This is not Jack, as Caprio uh, would have portrayed on the Titanic by, by the movie. This was a Joseph Dawson. He was a trimmer, probably one of the first to go. He would have leveled the ship, shoveled coal from one side to the other, just to keep the ship level and keep those furnaces lit. That's J. Dawson. 161, G.F. Bailey was a saloon steward. Number 290, R.C. Bistro, was a third-class steward. Frank Coach, number 253, was an able seaman. Number 83, William G. Dashwood, was a saloon steward. William Denton Cox, number 300. His name is on the front of that because it was identified in the... Uh, the late 1900s, is number 300. He's a third class steward, and he is known to be one of the third class uh, uh, crew members that actually went down and helped a lot of the third class people get up to deck so they could at least have hope of survival. He was truly a hero, William Denton Cox. Number 163, F. Woodford. He was a greaser. Number 241, an unidentified status, male. Number 11, John Shea was a saloon steward. Number 294, George Swain was a second-class passenger. Number 140 was a third-class passenger. Now we make our way around to the short. Number 134 was an unknown status, male. Notice the trend here, males. Number 209, huge stone. He was an Australian. His name was Arthur Gordon McRae. He was a second class passenger from Australia. And of course, the family, can you imagine what it would cost to send an Australian back to Australia in 1912? Of course, they couldn't afford that, but they could afford a stone. And they sent the money to have this stone for their son here at Fairview Lawn Cemetery. Three hundred and fourteen, Jacob Alfred Wickland. Three hundred and fourteen. He was a third class passenger. Wickland happened to have a brother. They were with each other always from the time before they got on the ship, on the ship, and when the ship probably went down. If he jumped, his brother probably jumped with him. It is said that if he's here, it's because they felt his brother was there as one of the unknown males. And so Jacob Alfred Wickland is with his brother at Fairview Lawn Cemetery. 327, Harold Reynolds, a third-class passenger.
James McGrady died April 15, 1912, body 330. Now, I did mention this, but there were 328 bodies basically plucked from the sea. A lot were buried at sea. 150 landed in Halifax. How was he tagged 330 if only 328 bodies were found? Well, human error, perhaps. Four boats looking, uh, yelling back and forth, what number did you use? What number body do you have? And more than likely, he was just considered to be, oh, well, I'll use 330 for Mr. McGrady. And he was the last plucked out of the water by the uh, Newfoundland vessel, a sea vessel. Uh, and, uh, and, and here he lays. Let's see what it says here. He was found floating three months after sinking off of St. John's, Newfoundland, and he was sent to Halifax. Now, you might notice that this is a short row. This is where that row ends. And the reason is, is probably because they were expecting more bodies. I mean, that was a month later, hard to believe. Row number four, Percy Delandes, a saloon steward and a crew member. Number eight, Wendla Maria Heininen. Number eight, this is a female. Ah, the second female. She was a third class passenger. They found her initials, VH, on a sweater. Mr. Barnstead, and they decided that, uh, hmm, that could be pronounced Wendla. But, of course, if it's Heinenin, more than likely it's Wendla. So they found VH and pretty, you know, put the, put the uh, speculation together and pretty well identified her as Wendla Maria Heinenin. Number 281 is a female, the third female. Number 240 is an unknown status, male. Number 329, C. Smith is a bedroom steward. Jenny Louisa Hendrickson, number three, third body haul out of the ocean, and the fourth female, and the last female in this cemetery. She was a third class passenger. They found the initials J.H. on a blouse or a sweater or a coat, and there were only so many JHs, in fact, only one JH on the passenger list, and it was Jenny Hendrickson. The next series of stones, 137, is an unknown status male, another unknown status male, an unknown status male, an unknown status male, number 92, an unknown status male, 296. And then there's L. Bogey, a bedroom steward, number 274. An unknown status male, 220. A crew member, male, 223. A crew ma member, male, 203. An unknown status male, 94. An unknown status male, 237. An unknown status male, 198. A crew member, Male, 128. An unknown status male, 254. An unknown status male, 229. 141, A. Matum was a chief butcher. 243, E. J. Stone was a bedroom steward. Now they found in the records of, uh, of the ship that there was an E. T. Stone. And that J was just misinterpreted or another human error. This is actually E.T. Stone, number 243. Number 213, an unknown status male. 262, Alan Vincent Franklin, identified later because his name is on the face of the stone. He was a saloon steward. Number 265 was a crew member, male. Number 233 was an unknown status male. Number 216 was a crew member male. Number 29 was an unknown status male. Number 257 
was a crew member male. Then there's 193, John Law Hume. They called him Jock. I've got a fantastic story here for you. Died in the sinking, of course. His body was later recovered by the Mackie Bennett. He was buried at Fairview Lawn. And Dr. Barnstead, as the coroner, marked these notes. It was number 193. He, weighed, he, he was about five foot nine, 145 pounds. He was about 28 years of age. He had light curly hair, clean shaven, no marks. He had a light raincoat, uniform jacket with green facing and vest, purple muffler. His effects were a cigarette case, a silver watch, an empty purse, a knife with carved pearl hanger, ha handle, a mute, a brass button with African royal mail, and English Lever watch. The members of the orchestra were employed by a Liverpool firm called C.W. and F.N. Black, who had contracts with all the steamer companies to provide musicians. Until 1912, they were paid six pounds to ten shillings a month, plus a monthly uniform allowance. Then the rates were cut to four pounds a month with no uniform allowance. On the 30th of April, Jock Hume's father received this short and unwelcome note from the Blacks. Dear sir, we shall be obliged if you will remit us the sum of five shillings four, which is owing to us as per enclosed statement. We shall also be obliged if you will settle the enclosed uniform account. Yours faithfully, C.W. and F.N. Black. That is sad. This was one of the members of the orchestra. The orchestra was uh, well, eight in it. There were three. Uh, one went down with the ship, one was sent back to England, and this was the first violinist. And he didn't know it, but he was a father. He was engaged, but he was also a father. One seventy nine, unknown male status. Two seventeen O. W. Samuel, crew, saloon steward. 97, Reginald Fenton Butler, second class passenger. You can see that they figured out that when he was born, they found some identification that would have uh, identified him where he was from when he was born to in indicate his age. Two hundred and seventy, Alfred Diebel was a saloon steward. And that ends this look at 121 stones at the Fairview Lawn Cemetery. As you can see, the stones are laid out very much like the bow of a ship, with the gap up here as if it hit the iceberg right on this left-hand corner or the right-hand corner of the boat, uh, if we were facing the bow. There are four rows. One, the little one here with room for more. The others, there's more identified on the first row, less identified on the last row, the Fairview Lawn Cemetery.